I have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle with the foe. Bring him home. Bring him home. Here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. Sing this song, bring a song, bring a song. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring a song, bring a song. I'm not really a pacifist, bring a song, bring a song. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring a song, you'd find me out on the firing line, bring a song, bring a even if they drop their queens to bomb, bring them home, bring them home. Though they brought helicopters and that bomb, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam, bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their palace. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And learning a few universal rules. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle Good evening. I'm John McAuliffe of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. It's This is one of many, many webinars that VPCC has organized, and this one has one of the deeper meanings, I think. Um, just a couple of things mechanically. We keep the chat off until the discussion part of the program. If you have a question, please put it on the Q&A page. And although it's human nature to try to put a comment on the Q&A page, please just put questions there. It makes it much easier for us to get the questions prepared for later on. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Rusty Carolyn Eisenberg, who is moderating the program tonight. Rusty. Hello, everyone. I wanna welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. Uh, we're fortunate to have on our panel four remarkable individuals, uh, Doug Hostetter, Robert J. Lifton, Cora Weiss, and Richard Falk. As a professor of U.S. foreign policy, I sometimes ask my students what they know about the My Lai Massacre. And usually only a sprinkling of students raised their hands. And in some classes, nobody's ever heard of My Lai. And to someone of my age, this is surprising because in the fall, since in the fall of 1969, news of Milai was splashed across the news media and for a short time seemed omnipresent. Yet in reflecting on today's panel, I was reminded that before 1969, there were many years when little was being publicized about American war crimes in Vietnam. 
And of course, among politicians, if they were even bothering to pay attention, there was silence. Yet among the people who educated the American public about the character of US activities in Vietnam, the persistence of US war crimes in that country, and the urgent need for ordinary citizens to stand up and to resist those ongoing crimes were the four people on this panel. Um, they raised, and I don't think this is an exaggeration to say that they helped to raise the consciousness of a whole generation of activists. It's especially appropriate that we hear from them at this historical juncture with daily reports of Russian war crimes. The myth of American innocence is dangerously resurrected and of course enabled by an erasure of the American record in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and elsewhere. I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers in order of their appearance, compressing their rich and valuable life contributions. And I, I was saying before we started, it took me much of the afternoon to get their life accomplishments into two sentences, but I'm not covering everything. Uh, so uh, the first speaker tonight will be Doug Hostel, who actually put this panel together. Um, he had worked on the staff of Project Redress, a campaign of civil disobedience addressing US war crimes in Vietnam. From a Mennonite background, Doug was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War. He completed his alternate service as a teacher of children in the embattled area of South Vietnam. And after a lifetime of service, Doug is presently UN representative for Pax Christi International. J. Robert Lift, Robert J. Lifton was, I keep wanting to put J in front of you now. Mm. Robert J. Lifton was one of the original organizers of Project Redress. He's a psychiatrist and author of path-breaking books on the psychological causes and effects of war, terrorism, and political violence. Lifton's clinical work with Vietnam veterans and his book, Home from the War, Vietnam Veterans, Neither Victims Nor Executioners, was and remains a major contribution to the field and was a major contribution for people at the time it appeared. Cora Weiss, who was arrested in Project Redress, played a pivotal role in the Vietnam anti-war movement here in the United States. As an organizer of Women's Strike for Peace, founder of the Committee of Liaison with Families of Servicemen. Cora visited v North Vietnam, dangerous to do that for lots of reasons, uh, visited North Vietnam several times, and then much later in life became the president and founder of the Hague Appeal for Peace. She has a lifetime of service on behalf of peace and social justice causes at home and abroad. Richard Falk, uh, another organizer of Project Redress, is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and presently Research Associate at the Center of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Richard Falk has served as Special Rapporteur on Occupied Palestine for the UN Human Rights Council. And in his many books and articles, Falk has been an extremely courageous and unceasing advocate for human rights and international law. So we're very fortunate in having all of them talk with us today. And I will we'll be beginning with Doug Hosted. Doug. Thank you very much, Rusty. Um, I was really privileged to be a staff member for Project Redress. I can't even remember who it was who first approached me to come and spend a couple of weeks calling people, asking them to come and commit civil disobedience in Washington. This was 50 years ago. I was a graduate student at the New School for Social Research and was also working as a resource specialist for peace at the United Methodist Office for the UN. But I had just returned a few years earlier from three years of alternative service in Vietnam in the middle of the war zone, helping Vietnamese children learn to read and write their own language after the American Air Force had destroyed their, their schools. I had gotten deeply involved in the anti-war movement when I came back, and it was actually partly just to assuage my survivor's guilt. Um, I had survived a war that so many of my friends had not. And also I had an opportunity at the end of my three years 
to come back to the United States and to go to graduate school, whereas my Vietnamese colleagues were stuck in the war. So I really threw myself into the anti-war movement. Project Re Redress actually offered an opportunity to move beyond the usual group that the anti-war movement had been uh, approaching. It was primarily a youth and student movement. Uh, it was strong, it was very active, but this was a chance to reach out beyond the students and youth to the academic, cultural, and religious elites of our country, to challenge them to be willing to petition Congress to redress the grievance of our government committing war crimes in Vietnam, and to be willing to stay there and get arrested if our grievance was not heard. I remember Judy Collins had just given us her address book and said, call all of my friends and tell them that you're calling on behalf of me and that you're asking them to join with me, to come to Washington, to be willing to be arrested if our petition for the redress of war crimes happening in Vietnam is not received by the Congress. Um, I remember at the time, most of the things that we talked about was the bombing of dikes and dams, the mining of the Haiphong Harbor. The Christmas bombings had not yet taken place, but there were plenty of other war crimes to talk about. It was amazing to call the writers, the intellectuals, the poets, the people that I had been reading and, and admiring in graduate school, Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, Richard Falk, Robert Lifton, Gloria Steinem, Denise Levertov, Muriel Ruckreiser, Francine Duplissett Gray, and many others. I was also able to get my boss at the United Methodist Office for the UN uh, to get arrested. And she got her bishop to be arrested. And we got the chaplain at the Church Center for the UN, a Southern Baptist pastor to get arrested. I wasn't quite sure of what the significance of all of this was until several months later, when we were trying a group of people in New York to figure out how do we respond to the outrage of, second, of Nixon's second inaugural address. This would have been January 20 uh, in uh, 1973. It was after the Christmas bombings, after the outrage of, of what had happened. And we were really looking to try to make a powerful statement in New York. And I remember Joe Papp, a talented theater producer and director said, well, I have several plays that are happening on the 20th. You can come to my plays and during the intermission, I will introduce you and you can stand up and tell the audience about the Christmas bombings and the fact that medical aid for Indochina is helping to rebuild the Bach Bai Hospital Fund that was destroyed there. So we were allowed to stand on the stage of New York theaters soliciting funds to rebuild hospitals in Hanoi. And I don't know who from who Redress did this, but someone got to many of the art galleries in New York. And this the art galleries agreed to turn one painting to the wall to cover it in black bunting. And if anyone asked to tell them that it was because of the American war crimes in Vietnam and the agreement from the galleries was that any painting that was sold on January the 20th, the commission from the gallery would go to medical aid for Indochina to rebuild the Bach Mai Hospital Fund. I began to understand how significant it was to move beyond just the students and youth, the broader American population. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Lifton. Th thank you, Doug. Thanks, Rusty. Um, <clears throat> let me say first that at the heart of redress were American crimes of war. Of course, it was opposition to the war but crimes of war were the issue and gave the moral energy to us to take that step from mere opposition to civil disobedience. I wrote a review essay in the New York Times earlier that year, 1971, uh, about two books on Milai, one by Seymour Hirsch 
and I spoke of America as having descended into existential evil in a war that was criminal, murderous, and suicidal. Those were words I used in my review in the New York Times. That was the atmosphere in this country at the time that redress emerged. For me, redress was about what I came to call the atrocity producing situation. By that term, I mean a, a situation in which ordinary young men and women, mostly men, of course, could enter who were no better or worse than you or me and end up committing crimes of war. And that was so because it was a counterinsurgency war far away in a, dis in a different culture, in a place where we weren't too popular and where it was difficult to tell the difference between combatants and civilians because of the military policy of body counts, free fire zones, and search and destroy missions, easy killing of anyone around. And finally, in the atrocity producing situation was the psychological state of men, of the American grunts, who were uh, seeing deaths of bodies, snipers in mines, and underwent a form of angry grief and, and rage toward an enemy who was everywhere and nowhere and whom they could not get to stand up and fight. I had it, so much the case was that, that when I had a chance to interview what I called an American survivor of My Lai, a young man who was there with the Amarakal company that committed the slaughter, but refused to fire, put his gun to the ground so that it was clear he wasn't firing, which in that situation was dangerous. And he described how people in that company, as they gunned down close to 500 babies, children, old men, old women, had the illusion of getting the enemy to finally come and fight. It was, uh, it was a situation in which they assumed a combat position as though they had engaged the enemy. In redress, there was a fundamental generational issue. Doug Hostetter has told how he was on the staff that came to create redress his generation did more than that. Young people like him, including Carl Rogers, Fred Brantman, Tom Davidson, Anita Dworkin, prodded those of us who were older, so-called adults, in their late 30s or early 40s, to take that further step. And we, certainly I, was more than ready for it. Uh, they found a kind of readiness in this mutuality of sharing the burden of protest. And of course, uh, those of us, the adults, had felt all kinds of self-criticism and feelings of guilt over leaving responsibility for opposing the war and committing civil, civil disobedience only to the young. We knew that was wrong. And in that sense, in prodding us, they did much to create redress and they did much to relieve the feelings of guilt uh, and uh, unresponsibility of the older generation of so-called adults. Redress, of course, Citizens Committee for Redress of Grievances uh, had two simple uh, legal uh, centers. And of course, they were created by our wonderful lawyers. We had great lawyers in uh, our group, including Richard and including Peter Weiss, Cora's husband, uh, and including Saul Mendelowitz. And there was the First Amendment right for citizens to uh, demand redress of grievances 
and to go to the people's house, that of the House of Representatives, which we did first. And of course, there was the Nuremberg obligation, which Richard will speak more about, the obligation of uh, the obligation to oppose war crimes of anyone, including and perhaps especially those of one's own country. Perhaps I became a leader of redress because I was so ready for it when approached by younger activists and they could, uh, they could readily see the intensity of my immersion. It was almost uh, simultaneous their prodding and my, uh, uh, my intensity in responding to that prodding. And of course, I did a lot of calling and trying to convince writers I knew or didn't know, academics, professionals of all kind, university officials and university presidents and media people. And my message always was, you have to break out of your ordinary routine. You'd be surprised how difficult that is for most people to break out of their ordinary routine and respond appropriately to this crisis, which means taking some risk uh, in the jargon of the time, putting your body on the line. Many were sympathetic to what I was doing and would say, I'm glad you were doing it, but we're afraid to do just that. So that at our first meeting in Washington, the night before our first action at the House of Representatives, it was like group psychotherapy where I was holding forth and they were asking me questions and I was trying to relieve their anxiety. But I couldn't do that as well as Dick Gregory, who, uh, <laughs> Happily, some of the younger people had invited to address our group. And Gregory, as you know, a great comedian and uh, also a social activist, uh, did it this way. He said to the group, look, I look at your faces and I can see you're a little frightened. He said, well, I was frightened the first time I did civil disobedience. So you know what I did? I found a couple of nuns and walked behind them. <laughs> Somehow that put everything into perspective, the logic, the, uh, the experience of being preceded in what had to be done by people of faith who were concerned enough to uh, take that small step. There was a certain amount of mock heroic humor in all of this. Uh, and I remember, for instance, we rehearsed the situation in which I presented to the Speaker of the House at that time, Carl Albert, the redress statement, which in essence said, we demand that you call a special session of Congress in order to end all funding of the Vietnam War. And Carl Albert looked at me and he said, I'll refer that to the appropriate committee. <laughs> I, was so, uh, I was so struck by that bureaucratise of his speech that I was literally dumbfounded and didn't know what to say. But fortunately, there was a savvy lawyer in back of me who whispered into my ear, tell him we find his response unsatisfactory. So I boomed out, I bellowed out, we find your response unsatisfactory. And that was my lesson in robotic, robotic politics. Uh, <laughs> in any case, um, when we went to the Senate a few months later, uh, we decided to lie down in uh, support of, uh, in response to the dead on all sides in Vietnam. It was interesting that no anti-war senators moved among us. They didn't want to be seen with us because civil disobedience was beyond their sense of what they were ready to do or what their constituents would approve of. The only senator who moved among, among us was none other than Barry Goldwater, the notorious supporter of the war. 
And the reason why he did that was that he was looking for his former speechwriter, Carl Hess, who had gone over to our side. So he walked among our bodies and we raised our hands from our prone position to lead him to where uh, Carl Hess was. And it was striking that Goldwater was the only senator who walked among us. Uh, other things that we just did after these two uh, actions, uh, uh, we held meetings, uh, we met with people, we took various anti-war stands, but those actions were the heart of what we were about. I could also be a kind of intermediary between the establishment and the young protesters. For instance, when I helped organize with so much help from others, the group of people who were to uh, walk to uh, walk to the Capitol and enter a room outside of the House of Representatives, I called up the then president of Yale, Kingman Brewster, who was admirable in what he learned on the job and very steady for all this and resisted and never did call the police at our uh, uh, protests. And I, I had been on friendly terms with him and I thought I should notify him that a large number of his faculty was going to be arrested uh, on behalf of civil, de civil disobedience opposing the war. And I then had a kind of um, sudden impulse that even surprised me. And I said, Kingman, would you like to join us? There was a silence and then a quiet answer to the effect, no, Robert, you do it your way and I'll do it mine. It was a very Yaley response in a way and a very nice one. Kingman Brewster together with Bill Coffin, who was an amazing figure through all this, uh, helped keep the calm at Yale and uh, dealt with uh, a very explosive trial uh, uh, in New Haven. Uh, and awesome. hmm. Bill Coffin spoke to everybody. He himself had formerly been in the CIA uh, before he had become a protester. He could speak to white radicals, black radicals, black panthers, uh, conservative whites, middle of the road people. And his message always to, was to let them be heard in a way that encouraged interaction and speech rather than violence. And in that way, Yale did indeed avoid violence. Uh, then when Richard and I and Gabriel Coco edited a book called Crimes of War, the society had some interest in this. It was uh, prominently reviewed and I could make my contribution, my psychological contribution, begin with me lie, the central but far from the only crime of the Vietnam War. Robert, can I, can I just interrupt, um, which I actually hate to interrupt because every part of your experience is really riveting, I think, for all of us, but I, I am worried about the time. So. Yes, okay, I'll take my remaining two minutes and get off the stage. Uh, the Vietnam War created the American way of war making uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, anti-war veterans emerging from those wars having less impact on uh, the world because they were isolated and there was no draft. And finally, what was the impact of redress? We can't know exactly, but I will say very briefly, it did not immediately stop the war. It did not create a sensation, but it did make its way into the minds of many in the media who responded and into uh, authorities in government who were supporting the war, who could now recognize that many professionals and prominent intellectuals were willing to uh, put their bodies on the line, commit civil disobedience, 
And in that sense, in the refusal of the country to carry through the war, which was expressed by GIs who refused to go out on combat missions, the whole country was being in the uh, minds of those, uh, of those uh, GIs and redress made its modest but significant contribution to that refusal. Thank, Thank you. you so much for this story that's really important for everybody to know. Let me switch now to Cora Weiss. Cora? Thank you and hello everyone. On our most patriotic holiday, July 4, 1969, I, with other American and Canadian women, met with a delegation of women from North and South Vietnam in Canada on a farm near Toronto. They represented the Vietnam Women's Union. I represented Women's Strike for Peace, both civil society organizations. And I believe that it's the power of civil society that makes change happen. So that's very important in the role that I've played over the last 60 years or more. So uh, in Toronto, Madame Winyak Zung invited me to find two other women to come to Vietnam under bombs that fall. I was co-chair at the time of the mobilization against the war in Vietnam and partly responsible for the November 15, 1969 demonstration in Washington, DC. <clears throat> she understood I couldn't travel until after November 15. So I asked Madeline Duckles of California, representing Wilf, and Ethel Taylor from Pennsylvania to join me on this unique trip to Vietnam. We brought a proposal with us to give to the Vietnam Women's Union because we don't negotiate in wartime with governments uh, to try to undo or end the pretext that the Nixon administration was using to uh, continue the bombing of North Vietnam by saying that they were torturing our prisoners of war. And we said, if we didn't bomb, they wouldn't shoot down the planes and they wouldn't take prisoners of war. So we brought a proposal, which is unique in wartime, to ask if every prisoner of war could write one letter a month to a member of their family, and if we could bring one letter a month to give to them. <clears throat> they accepted the proposal, and we not only got that done, but we sent three people a month until the end of the war, carrying mail back and forth and serving as eyewitness reporters on, the, on what was going on in Vietnam. But we also asked them to improve the quality of packages that prisoners of war could receive. And after some discussion, they accepted that idea. We established the Committee of Liaison with Families of Servicemen Detained in Vietnam, and it would be the first of my many trips to North Vietnam and later South Vietnam. I'm not a lawyer and leave it to lawyer Richard Falk to tell us what a war crime is, but I believe that war is a crime and should be abolished. We've abolished other institutions, so it's not an impossible dream. There's a resolution on the floor of the UN calling for the crime of aggression to be adopted, which I hope will happen before yet another war happens in this war-filled world. I can report on what I've seen, and you have to say whether it's a war crime. For example, you, somebody has already mentioned the Bakmai Hospital. At that time, 
It was the largest teaching hospital in what we called Indochina. <clears throat> and to help repair the damage, <clears throat> we created, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Friendship Mint, an organization that tried to support the repairing of Bakhmai Hospital. But the major consequence was that many doctors, nurses, patients were killed. After we received, and Dick Falk, Richard Falk was with me in September of 1972, when the Vietnamese made a peace gesture <clears throat> by releasing three prisoners of war to the peace movement. And we brought three of the men home, but they invited us to bring along a member of the family of each POW, which is amazing to happen, which we did. And the three of them and their mother and the mother and the wife of another um, joined us in a short trip to the southern part of North Vietnam to see war damage. And the first place we went to was the Phat Siem Cathedral, an extraordinary cathedral, ancient. And it was just destroyed in a bombing. Military target? I doubt it. We met a young man who was carrying his bride-to-be on his back because her feet had been blown off by landmines. Now the landmine treaty happened more recently and they're banned, but to this day, landmines are still being found in Vietnam and American veterans, interestingly, are going over to join Project Renew, run by Chuck Searcy, where <clears throat> former soldiers who may have planted these mines, some of them, are now taking them out and uh, making them unusable again. But landmines have been found on farms, killing livestock, in uh, rice paddies where women go to plant rice, in anywhere on roads so that cars are blown up. Are those war crimes? I leave it to Falk. <laughs> Unexploded ordnance is a huge consequence of any war. And that's another reason to abolish war. Agent Orange is a weaponized toxin in a hospital room that was in Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, we were shown shelves of large jars containing what they call monster fetuses from pregnant women who were victims of Agent Orange. American soldiers were also affected by Agent Orange, which travels from parent to children whose disabilities continue today. And there is a law passed by Congress giving money, not just for the Vietnamese victims of Agent Orange, but also for the American victims who were in Vietnam when we were throwing Agent Orange around. Are those war crimes? They weren't military targets. And My Lai, well, the My Lai massacre is probably best known by Americans as the major example of brutality experienced during the, Viet the Vietnam War. And babies were torn for their, from their mothers, shot, tortured, and thrown into a huge ditch, and men and women also. Were these all war crimes? Today, Vietnam is a favored trading partner. Women's underwear is made in Vietnamese factories. Vietnam is a favored place for bike riding trips. But my husband and I were among the redress people arrested for our lie-in in Speaker Carl Albert's 
congressional office protesting the bombing of dams and the city of Hanoi and the harbor of Haiphong. That's the power of civil society, which helped to end the war in Vietnam. Here are my Washington DC jail cellmates. Great women. Thank you. And let's please try to do something to put diplomacy in place instead of weapons to end the Ukraine war. Thank you, Cora. Um, let me turn quickly mm -hmm. to Richard Falk. Uh, th thank you, Rusty. Uh, it's a uh, moving experience for me to be part of this uh, revisiting of the redress experience and more generally uh, the role of what I think Robert uh, appropriately identified as existential evil that became so uh, violently <laughs> apparent as the Vietnam War went on year after year. Uh, in in trying, to, uh, I um, would mention also for on the basis of what Doug said about uh, Joe Papp's uh, contribution uh, that I enjoy the part of redress that I probably enjoyed most was being his cellmate uh, after the uh, the action took place. But um, I want to say at the outset that. Uh, this issue of war crimes is uh, really very difficult to talk about uh, in a short uh, presentation. Uh, from the time of, of uh, Nuremberg, there have been three categories of war crimes that are uh, usefully distinguished. Uh, crimes against the peace, which the uh, decision declared to be the overarching crime. In other words, aggression was viewed to be the crime of crime. And the extension of the war from South Vietnam to North Vietnam on the basis of a false flag operation in the Gulf of Tonkin that gave a, 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 a false pretext uh, for retaliating, whereas it was in actual terms and uh, the initiation of an aggressive war against a uh, what then was a separate sovereign state and therefore committed uh, uh, the crime of aggression. And one shouldn't forget that there had been a war against the mm -hmm. French for all of Indochina that ended in 1962 with an international agreement called the Geneva Accords. And in that agreement was a commitment to hold elections in South Vietnam to determine the uh, permanent governing authority of that country. Eisenhower famously said, if that election had been held, 80% of the South Vietnamese would have voted for Ho Chi Minh. In other words, they, the, nor, the legal norm of self-determination, which underlay all the anti-colonial wars, was fundamentally violated in a way that probably, had it been adhered to, would have avoided the war altogether. So, it's important to understand that international law, if it's respected, is itself a very important instrument of sustaining peace. And war crimes are a kind of existential evil that uh, is occasioned by war and uh, as Cora mentioned, 
we've come to a point in human history where war as such is an abomination and is something that the human species cannot any longer endure and hope to survive right. in any, uh, in any uh, coherent form. And that's aside from the ecological challenges that are distracted from whenever there is a kind of immediacy associated with even the peripheral involvement in war as the Ukraine crisis has illustrated. So one of the important things also to remember was that Franklin Roosevelt during World War II urged Germans to collect information about the violation of uh, war crimes uh, law uh, that existed. In other words, uh, collect information about, collect evidence about uh, the commission of crimes by uh, Nazi uh, civilian and military operations. And in a sense, he was saying, betray your government on behalf of upholding international morality and international law. And I've termed that the Nuremberg obligation, which is a way of saying that citizens have at least a nonviolent right to obstruct the perpetuation of a war, certainly an unlawful war, a war of aggression, as I believe the Vietnam War became in 1965. And that's uh, really very fundamental because it's really saying that there is a obligation transcending the uh, duty to uh, obey your government and to it's, a, it's being, it's a patriotism for humanity rather than a patriotism for a nation state. And I, again, I think with the kind of world we're living in, that's the only kind of patriotism that we should uh, honor. Milai was, of course, the kind of sh uh, shocking uh, 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 escalation of criminality. It was sort of pure crime and a helpless civilian being lined up and slaughtered. And it epitomized uh, what was wrong about the whole engagement in Vietnam. And it's been repeated, unfortunately, uh, after uh, the experience of Vietnam uh, has faded from the memory of many people. And one of the sad things is how little our political class and foreign policy elites have learned from the Vietnam experience. They've rep essentially repeated it in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in a whole series of countries. And uh, among other things, they can't acknowledge that military power does not any longer control political outcomes. That's a, a huge pragmatic uh, understanding that very rarely, and the Russians don't understand that either. They've had their Afghanistan experience and their Ukraine experience, but but we can't. But our system is so geared to war and war making and arms industry and lo uh, lobbying that it can't admit that war doesn't work 
as an instrument of control and change. And there, I think, again, we have to ponder uh, Cora's uh, opening remark that it's civil society that we must rely upon to achieve uh, the kind of restorative change uh, that makes peace and justice and sustainability possible in the 21st century. And if we don't do that, we almost certainly face a catastrophic future. Uh, I, I just wanted to say one more thing about uh, Agent Orange, which prompted me to coin the phrase ecocide uh, based on the writings of a couple of scientists in Scientific American. It was the first uh, contemporary instance where deliberate warfare against the environment was undertaken and had disastrous human effects. I visited a couple of years ago in Vietnam, the genetic deformities that are still being attributed to the Agent Orange that was left behind, seeped into the water supply and into the uh, agricultural uh, land uh, uh, in Vietnam. So it was, and interestingly, it was an existential crime, but not a crime that could be prosecuted because it hadn't been uh, categorized as, as something of a crime. But in other words, uh, what I would say is that Vietnam gave the American leadership and society an opportunity to change course and to realize that upholding international law and demilitarization were the best ways of promoting national interests in the 21st century. And we still haven't, we're still far from learning that elementary lesson. And until we learn it, we can unfortunately expect to repeat tragic experiences of it that Vietnam exemplify. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you to, to all of you. Uh, we wanted to give a couple minutes for any comments that the panelists want to make in response to each other. Cora, you're muted. That happened. Oh, now you're there. You're, you're here. Um <clears throat> wanted to ask <clears throat> Richard and whoever else wants to jump in. The only people on the whole earth who really don't want to get rid of war because they're doing very well are the weapons makers, the contractors, and the legislators who support them by voting for increased military budgets every minute almost. The amount of money that's being poured in to weapons, which are then, by the way, resold by the, in the black market be, among countries. I mean, people in Germany are buying weapons that we're sending to the Ukraine. But that's a serious problem because as long as the legislators are enjoying sending more weapons instead of diplomacy, I mean, the fact that there is literally no funding for active diplomacy, backstage, side, however you want to call it, any kind of diplomacy, it's incredible that we're not doing it. Uh, I we think we're, I mean, there's a lot that can be said in response. There is a, um, uh, an initiative underway uh, to have a, a people's tribunal on what the organizers are calling merchants of death, 
which is exactly what uh, Cora was referring to. The, uh, Who's doing it? It's being done by this anti-drone, and you know, Kathy Kelly and uh, Nick uh, something, <laughs> I can't remember his name, but, the, but the, it's a very well-organized initiative. And they're determined to have, they've served subpoenas to Lockheed and three other, Raytheon and a couple of other corporations. So that, but I, I, the point I really wanted to make was that it's, the weapons makers are feeding off a long tradition of political consciousness that is deeply inscribed in the public as well as in the elite that security comes through military strength right and and it's that consciousness that one has i mean you can't get rid of the weapons makers until you also discredit this consciousness that sustains war making and brings national pride to victories in war. I mean, it is the source of a celebratory, uh, uh, celebratory expressions of national uh, vigor and even virtue to win war. And, and so it's, it's, it requires a deep educational experience. It's not something that there's no quick fix, in other words, to get rid of war. But that's I, know, but... I wonder if I could uh, add something to what Richard said. Um, uh, when I studied Nazi doctors and the whole Nazi project, I came to recognize both professional killers and killing professionals. What I mean by that is that uh, whatever the weapons, whatever the war making, you need professionals who are responsible for making the weapons technically, for uh, projecting their use, and for providing rationales for their use. So that to get back to the redress idea of professionals taking a stand against war and against crimes of war, there is a whole ugly history of professionals seeing their function as merely technical and their services to be provided to the highest bidder to further what can be called a malignant normality which is given more strength uh, and made all the more difficult by professional uh, uh, recognition and following of that malignant normality. So that with all the technical aspects of war making and the uh, terrible process of weapons makers uh, thriving on them, there are always professionals like you or me who are part of that process and whose work has to be examined in relation to the killing. Next question. Yes. Oh, well, that's my question. <laughs> um, it's coming as a history professor, but you know, I, I, it was as the war in, in Vietnam ended. Um, there was certainly a very widespread, I'm not saying majority, but a very widespread understanding by that time that the United States was responsible for significant war crimes in Vietnam, and you know, several of all the folks on this panel really, you know, played a role in creating that consciousness in the public. But as a history teacher, I am like astonished that that's got how much of that has gotten erased. That there, that the you know, there's just 
an awareness of what actually happened in Vietnam. I know, you know, the, the commonplace idea now is, well, we were in this war, it wasn't winnable, you know, it ended, thank God. Um, but the the awareness of what was done in Vietnam or what it was that motivated this tremendous resistance movement that there was an acts of bravery that seems to be erased of war crimes and not only are those things said well that was fifty years ago but even in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan you know in the case of you know fairly report wild, widely reported examples there's no awareness of war crimes there either I mean I that you know that's why I started in a way in my classes where they're talking about Russian war crimes, but, you know, with absolutely no awareness whatsoever that this is something that went goes beyond Russia. And I'm wondering with all of you, I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought, you know, what could have happened so that there was some historical recognition of what was actually done and why it is that people resisted? What so I now think, you all have three minutes for that. What I think you're raising, uh, Rusty, is what can be called the post-war war. That is, there is an actual war in which people kill each other. And there is, during the war, and even more importantly, after the war, struggle over how to understand and how to remember that war. The defeat in Vietnam was unacceptable to the American sense of being a dominant superpower, just as the crimes of war were unacceptable to the American sense of being a decent people. But there has been, over the past half century, a wave of expression that seeks to refight the war and have it come out another way. And that is the Rambo phenomenon the series of Rambo films in which an omnipotent American veteran or his group helps to reverse the outcome of the war. This time we win it is the expression that is said. And that's why a webinar like this one tonight is so important. It is part of the post-war war, part of revisiting the Vietnam War in terms of what it really did and what it was, rather than the uh, distorting mythology of reversing the outcome and negating the actual crimes of war in the service of uh, American uh, self uh, in the service of American self-expression. And we have to guard against that. Uh, and I think everything said on this panel tonight uh, is in the service of bringing back the terrible truths of that war and confronting the falsehoods uh, put forward in reversing it in the post-war war. Can I, can I add one thought? Yes, Richard, go ahead. Um, we should remember we should remember two things uh, that uh, after World War II Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not prosecuted as war crimes right Victor's justice set a very bad example as to what constitutes a war crime if you win a war there are no crimes uh, and and further, the UN Charter was designed to give the most dangerous states in the world, the five permanent members and winners of World War II, a permanent right of exception uh, that allows them legally to oppose any kind of decision that's based on uh, I, uh, based on policies that clash with their strategic interests. So it's very, ambi it's very uh, ambiguous legally whether they're capable under modern international law of committing crimes as it's understood, not existentially by people like ourselves, but in a 
judicial uh, framework in a, in a normal international criminal court setting. The uh, veto power in the Security Council is a direct contradiction of criminal responsibility by the geopolitical actors in the world. And we have to face that defect or characteristic of international society as it's now constructed. Thank you. You know, I'm noticing now that the questions in the the questions are piling up in the in the Q and A that folks want to ask. So John McCall, if you want to um, sure. take it away and 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 let some of those questions be, be okay. heard by everybody. All right. Well, two people, Howie Mochtinger and Alex Knopp, asked about the Bertrand Russell War Crimes Tribunal, which involved a, a lot of prominent intellectuals and artists, especially European. Um, and the question, it seems to go to whether that had any impact in the US uh, and any impact on the way the war was conducted. Does anybody want to pick up that one? Well, I would say, first of all, everything counts. It didn't have the impact that it should have had. And there were various voices that tried to undermine it. But whenever somebody asks, well, is what is being done of any importance? Of course it's of importance. And uh, that tribunal that you're referring to uh, was an expression of very established human beings who expressed their conscience and uh, their sense of as Richard put it, a larger ethical perspective that encompassed humankind rather than a particular nationality. Uh, and in that sense, of course, it had an effect. And I think that the redress effort, modest as it might have been, was very much in the spirit of the Russell Tribunal. Uh, just an, uh, a word beyond that, it's the best documentary record of the war crimes that were committed in Vietnam. There's no better place uh, to understand the range of criminality than the proceedings of the Russell Tribunal. So it brought together information and did have a big impact in Europe. Richard, can I ask, is there any way for you to make your microphone closer or louder? Uh, I'm not very digitally adept. I mean, we can hear you, but you're, but if you were louder, that would be better. Um, go ahead, John. Okay. Um, there's a, another kind of question that brings it in contemporary discussion. Um, the identification of war crimes is a partisan activity. Richard has already referred to that. Um, the victors don't do war crimes. Um, but the, the viewing and speaking about war crimes is a partisan activity. Uh, there's a great deal of American concern about war crimes by the Russians that is mainstream American institutions, newspapers and politicians talking about Russian war crimes. Um, the Russians, of course, deny completely that there's any war crimes. And the uh, some people on the US left tend to follow that perspective. Um, but the media never bothers to mention the, comp the parallels. Uh, the Christmas bombing that has been referred to here of Hanoi, uh, or even more Iraq. How, did anyone ever see any media comparison of shock and awe with Russian bombing in Ukraine? You know, I think that uh, America is sort of relieved to be on the right side 
of war crimes in Ukraine in opposing them. And as you're inferring or the questions inferred, uh, there's a ready inclination to uh, ignore American war crimes in other wars, uh, not just Vietnam, but Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. Uh, the difficulty is in, and I think that's what this whole panel is saying, the difficulty lies in universalizing these issues so that a war crime, uh, and it can have uh, can have descriptions and uh, can be described and identified. A war crime by anybody, anywhere, is to be opposed and is a profound indication of a society committing them moving into existential evil. Any other comments? Well, I, I would just say that uh, the discourse on uh, international war crimes has become a geopolitical tool rather than a normative framework that, as Robert just said, has universal applicability. The essence of law is to treat equals equally. And if you, uh, for instance, exempt Israel from any accountability, but hold Russia totally accountable, uh, you're committing the kind of double standards that invalidate law altogether. See, and that's, it's a, a subversion of law to engage in such double standards. And, and, uh, you can you can still say as I I have on this that existentially there's no question that Russia is committing uh, war crimes in Ukraine, but can you say it with a straight face as a government of one of these geopolitical actors, the five permanent members of the Security Council? They use international law and international criminal law as geopolitical tools to attack adversaries and protect uh, their allies and friends. That's not law. Um, I'm leaving it to you to read. Okay. All right, no, no, I, but if anyone else wants to deal with that before. Um, there was a question right at the beginning that goes in a somewhat different direction. And I don't know even if if anyone has any thoughts about it, but uh, this was in a reference to JFK's uh, October 1963 speech uh, in which he raised the question of withdrawal from Vietnam. Um, and the, the person is asking, had... Was there any possibility of that, I assume, and, and what that would have uh, meant in terms of American history in Vietnam and, and the issues that we've been talking about? Does anybody reach, want to reach that far back into options in American history? It isn't that it's far back. It's just impossible to know uh, whether whatever JFK said would have led to withdrawal from Vietnam. And there have been opinions expressed either way. Uh, I was in Vietnam uh, just after the French left, after their defeat at Dien Bien Phu. And I was there because my wife was a correspondent and, and doing work there and I accompanied her. And we talked to the French uh, journalists and uh, and various French officials there. And they said to us, you'll see, this place is quicksand. Uh, you can't possibly win. Uh, it was known that McNamara himself made that conclusion very early on. 
but didn't have the courage or the responsibility to state it. So there was very early recognition that the Vietnam War was impossible to win and that nothing could be gained by America pursuing it and in a way taking over a, a more or less colonial burden from the French. Uh, and what could have prevented that and should have prevented that is unclear, but it would have required uh, uh, a more uh, a bold rejection of taking on any war making in Vietnam. But just uh, if I can add a footnote to what Robert just said, uh, the, to me that uh, is, is interesting beyond the narrow fact because the U.S. devoted enormous resources and established total military superiority in Vietnam and yet lost the war. See, that, that to me is one of the unlearned lessons. That military superiority doesn't work in the post-colonial age. Right. And that plus um, the danger in every war of some kind of nuclear development. I spent six months in Hiroshima and my conclusion from interviewing survivors of that first use of a nuclear weapon was one plane, one bomb, one city. And that was a tiny weapon compared to the larger hydrogen weapons, as we know of a thousand times the destructive power. So to add to our concerns uh, in this panel, is the ever present danger of escalation into a nuclear phase that could certainly destroy existing civilization and possibly all of humankind. Uh, those, are, those are words uh, that are not simply cliches, they are actual possibilities. And that is the danger of any war that is undertaken in the 21st century. Um, I want to encourage the panelists to also look at the list of questions. And if there's questions that which you can look at by clicking on Q&A, if there are questions there that you want to respond to, you should certainly initiate that conversation. Um, our most recent question was, is there any list a compilation of war crimes committed by U.S. forces in Vietnam. Um, the Bertrand Russell Tribunal has been referred to already. I don't know if that's available online somewhere, but if it is, we'll put it on the blog page. Um, you'll find on the blog page in the resources list uh, both an article and a book by Nick Terse, uh, who is who did research in the post-war records, the post-war archives, uh, to try to identify war crimes. Um, so I'd, that's one place. Go to that page that you registered on and, and check out either of those sources. Um, now, I'm not sure if, Robert, are you showing that, those papers? We're seeing them on the camera, and I don't know if you're. No, if you I'm not sure. Just... I'm just glancing at them. Uh, okay. I, I, the the point I was uh, thinking about is war crimes uh, have been described by several of us, uh, and Core in particular uh, mentioned particular mentioned uh, actual events that should certainly be viewed as crimes of war but they could also include deep degradation, such as the dismemberment and chopping up of bodies, things that we don't like to talk about or think about, 
So they could include a kind of degradation that becomes the norm psychologically. Uh, when I talk to anti-war veterans, uh, one of them said to me, "What?" Uh, he said, he began to wonder, what the hell are we doing there? We don't take territories. We don't give it back. We just, uh, we just dismember bodies. What the hell are we doing here? So there is a human degradation in war when it uh, devolves into certain kinds, certain kinds of crimes that take us to the very lowest uh, and most egregious expressions of human behavior. Uh, that should not be ignored. We have nine minutes left, and I just would be very distressed if we left this whole conversation without some suggestions of what people can and should be doing. And if that's okay with you, um, I just think we really, really can't sit, keep sitting down and taking it lightly because there are two, the apocalyptic twins of climate change and nuclear weapons, and they are both existential threats to survival of, of everything, of the whole future. So people have to start thinking about how to merge the issues so that we don't siloize everything we do in life. They're, they're, we, we, we make ourselves stronger if we join our issues and join each other in the uh, discussion and in the solutions. And we've got to use the vote. I mean, this business about ignoring the questions about the nuclear weapons and climate at, for uh, candidates has to stop. But I don't know what else people want to say. Well, we we can start to answer your request or insistence, and you're right in doing so by looking at the levels that we can in which we can act, because we have already identified those levels. There is the vote, and sometimes activists like ourselves demean the vote. It it doesn't really do enough. But it's extremely important, and we could see that even in the recent elections, uh, to the extent to which they helped us prevent uh, a total loss of democracy. So there's the vote, the electoral involvement. There are movements of various kinds. We've discussed many of them, and we may well need a new kind of movement. And there is in those movements, great power of survivors. Once you've been exposed to uh, the danger at hand, as in Hiroshima survivors, you can speak and act with authority about alternatives, as in the case of Hiroshima survivors who took a strong stand against nuclear weapons and were heard at the UN in the latest uh, outlawing of nuclear weapons. And then there is the third level of civil society, which Cora has emphasized, and we're all talking about. Uh, and that means each of us in his or her own life and own surroundings and own connections and relationships uh, lives in relationship lives in connection with uh, an anti-war, anti-nuclear, and uh, anti-climate change position in our society. It's the very exposure to these things and an element of survival from them that can call forth uh, what we can call survivor power. And that's what we have to call upon right now at all of those levels. There's no place in society where some such action shouldn't be taken. I'm looking at the time 
Um, and we, I think we have enough material to discuss for another three hours. And, and thank you, Cora, because I think, you know, reminding us that the history of the past, the story of the past doesn't exempt us from figuring out what we're supposed to do tomorrow. And in the face of this immediate Barbara Ween has a very good point in the chat, chat column, if you'll open it and read it. I didn't know anything about this. 80 organizations yesterday had an all-day strategy meeting on climate change and peace, apparently. Representatives from countries joined over Zoom. This Zoom thing is really this huge power. You know, and thinking just if I real quick summary comments, and there's no way to summarize it all, so it'll be really quick. But, you know, one thing we sometimes forget is that back in the Vietnam era, it took a long time to overcome this belief in American innocence. So we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, we stand for humanity, other people are wicked. That duality, it was very hard to overcome that way of thinking about the world and to begin to get people to appreciate the complexities of really what was actually going on. And I think we still face that now, right? Which is in some ways a resurrection of American innocence. And that there is a sort of notion of a split world that's making it difficult to organize. However, that said, we have to organize. So let me turn it back to, first of all, let me thank all the panelists um, for your contribution tonight, but also because of your contribution over so many years and in really inspiring the activism of other people. And let me go back to John McCullough with a few mechanics. Okay. Um, and let me just note a question, a couple of people had asked questions about whether there was any effort after the end of the war to have an accounting of responsibility for war crimes. And the answer is no. Um, that there was an American sentiment of wanting to help with rebuilding in Vietnam, but there was uh, never any serious effort to try to relook at that history. The other side of the equation is the Vietnamese, though they had won the war in conventional terms or in their terms, uh, were not in a position to impose anything on the US the way the US could impose on Germany or Japan after the Second World War. And they were more interested in having good relations with the US than they were in having a moral or legal judgment about what the US had done during the war in their country. So it's that's a whole other area of discussion that might be worth exploring. Um, I want to just tell you what's coming up. Uh, the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee on December 5th will have its uh, second program on music of the Vietnamese era, Vietnam era rather, um, Holly Near, Linda Tillery, and Chris Matthews will be on that one. We did a program a few days ago with Peter Yarrow, which is available with Peter Yarrow uh, and uh, Sonny Oaks and Reggie Harris, and that's available now on a lovely uh, YouTube video. Um, this program, hopefully by tomorrow, will be available on YouTube and we will send out the link to it. Um, the other program we're doing, um, I realized that Rusty was doing wonderful introductions of everybody else, but of course she didn't introduce herself and I probably should have. Um, if, you, if you look on our blog page, you'll see the basics of her introduction and on December 11th, she will be uh, one of the focal points of a program we're doing on two books, a book that she's just published uh, about the Nixon administration, um, and also a book that Skip Isaacs has published right after the war that's going to, is being reissued. And this is our opening of the anniversaries of, of the final, in a sense, the final American combat stage of the war, uh, the Christmas bombing and the 
Paris peace agreement that led to to the withdrawal of American forces and the return of of prisoners. So you'll get those information on that. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that they'll be coming up. Um, we we uh, as a practice do not charge for webinars, um, but that doesn't mean they don't cost money to produce. So uh, when you get the note from us about the YouTube programs, you'll find a link where donations can be made, which will be helps us pay the cost of <laughs> for Zoom and uh, constant contact and all of the other administrative things that make possible what we're doing. Um, so uh, thank you, Doug, for conceiving this project and seeing it to fruition. Uh, thank you, Rusty, for moderating it. And thank you, Robert, Richard, and Cora for your bringing to a, a new generation the wisdom of your generation. So unless Rusty, you or Doug, no, if you want to say something. No, thank Doug, our you... audience and thank our speakers is really great okay. to be part of the panel. Doug, do you have any final comment? Uh, not really. It, uh, this was, uh, I was really inspired 50 years ago for those of you who were professionals at the time while I was a student who were willing to actually put your body on the line uh, over something that was morally and ethically uh, important for us to say at that time. And I would hope that um, today's generation, the uh, professionals, the intellectuals, the uh, academics and the artists will follow suit in um, the challenges that we have today, which are of equal uh, or greater uh, um, threats to our, our civilization and our world. Right. And we are all a part of the history of what happened and what will happen. So take care everyone and, and have a good Thanksgiving, a happy Thanksgiving and uh, a happy holidays of the end of the year, Christmas and Hanukkah and everything else. And, and we hope to see you again in our future programs. Take care.